We turn to you with all your heart, even by thy name, Jesus. We give you glory and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. You may enter in. Last week, there were a few of us here. Pretty interesting ones. Okay. I, I did something. I, um, run back. This is another voice of the messenger, Radio Broadcast. Coming to you live from the Gospel of Jesus Evangelistic Pentecostal Church in St. Coast Bay, Tortola BVI. Our speaker this morning is none other than our pastor and prophet, Stanley A. Bernard. Okay, so God took from Isaiah 40 to the end of Isaiah, declaring who he really is to Israel. So he asked them the, these two questions, and twice he asked them. So last week we looked at it, and then we went to the fact that the Bible said, um, when he asked, to whom will you like me to, and to whom will you compare me to, and whom shall be like, you know, my likeness, so to speak. And he said, everything is like just speck of dust to him. And, and he said, even this earth is just like a drop in a bucket to him. Praise be the Lord. In the end, he said, they that wait upon the Lord shall, you know it, say shall renew their strength, say it. And they shall walk and not faint. Right? And so in it, then he started declaring who he is. So we look at um, Philippians chapter 2, and the Bible said, let this mind be in you. You can turn there and just review what we did, right? He said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 2. Everybody found that one? Are you found it? Philippians chapter 2, 5. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, taught it not robbery to be equal with God. And Sister B is asking the question, you know, I wonder why, like Paul used the word robbery. And again, it is to make no big deal about it while he was here on earth. So in other words, he didn't just walk around and said, I am God. Okay? Good. All the works that he did and everything that he showed mankind, he was showing them who God really is. Are you understanding that? So in other words, he reveals God's likeness to us. He reveals God's character to us. He reveals God's humility to us. He reveals God's faithfulness to us. All of this thing, but he also revealed the power of God. And so... Sometimes when we Christians think of the power of God, we oftentimes think of miracles and all of this kind of thing, right? But you've got to understand, the ability to keep you is the power of God. Are you understanding that? So when you look at Galatians 2, for example, verse 20, it said, For I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life I now live in the flesh. Notice God never said it is your faith, Okay. He said, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You understand that? Now the word faith, you've got to understand this too. Faith is not something that comes from you. Regardless of how it goes, it is God who gives it to man. If they want to exercise any belief in him, it is he who gives them the faith to believe. Are you understanding that? So you've got to understand if somebody is searching and so on and so forth, God will give him the faith to us. To press, to find what? Whatever he's looking for in terms of the right direction. So faith actually comes from God. Are you understanding that? That's why the Bible tells you that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because those who come to him, they have to believe that he is. That in other words, he exists. And that he's the reward of them that what? Diligently. And notice that the word diligent there suggests what? Let's you to wake up, man. What the word diligent mean? When somebody say you are diligent, or they said you, you're a person who worked diligently, what are they saying? Pardon me? Not exactly. Okay, work hard, persistent, all of that kind of stuff. Not thoroughly search for something. Diligently, right? Pardon me? 
Yeah. Yeah, but we're not, talk we're not talking in the word search. You're tying it to the word search. We're just talking more diligent. When somebody said you're diligent, or you work diligently, okay? You are a person who do what? You're consistent, you work hard, you press, you name it, you do it, right? Good. So he said what? If you, if it said, if you have faith, right? Or if you don't have any faith, it's impossible to please God. Because those who come to him must believe that he is. And that he's what? Of them that what? So, so God, God is a reward of them who seek him what? Diligently. Continuously. All the time. Always seeking him. You get it? So in other words then, if you want me to put it the other way, God has no time to waste with people who flip flop all the time. Are you following that? So you got to understand then, seeing that faith comes from God, is the faith of Jesus Christ that we, what? Must have. It is, he said, Paul said, he has what? The faith of Christ. Right? And that's what we have to have. That's what we have to what? Seek. So when, that's why when you go to your extremities and you cannot go anymore, you got to what? Always rely on Jesus Christ. Because that's why I said, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. In your weakness when you can't go any further, it is his faith that takes you through, not your faith. Are you following that? Good. So we can say it again. For I am crucified with Christ nevertheless. In other words, I die to the world, right? And all that. I'm crucified with Christ nevertheless. Yes, Galatians 2.20. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ what? Lives in me. Right? And he said what after that? The life I am now living where? In my physical body. That's what he means right there. I live by the faith of what? The son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He said that's the faith he's living by. Praise he the Lord. Okay? Good. So, Philippians, let's go back to verse 5. 2 verse 5, right? So God asked a question in Isaiah 40, to whom will you compare me to? To whom will, be, um, will you liken me to? Good, so he said here, so notice then in verse 5, the way of humility. And believe it or not, you know, we have to learn how to be humble before God. Seriously. Are you understanding that? Yeah, sometimes our pride grows real big. And sometimes we get big-headed and do all sort of nonsense and be about a sort and character. And we think it is all right. It is not all right when it comes to God. Now, the Bible tells you here, let's read that, what he said here. Who being in the form of God, and notice it is showing you, he being in the form of God, taught it not robbery to be equal to God. In other words, he made no big deal over it. Read what it said after this. But it made himself of what? No reputation. So it's not somewhere he went and just turned up and said, I am God. Everybody, I am God. Okay? He made himself of what? No reputation. But he chose to do what? He took on himself the form of a servant. That's the attitude we should have. Hello, everybody. That's the attitude we should have. You've got to understand this. There's somewhere in Luke. It says this. Jesus gave one of those parables and he said that if the man... Um, if, if a, a man who was, let's say, what we would call a farm, okay? And he said, if he comes out of the field, or his, his, his servants come out of the field, his servant rather, come out of the field, will he say to his servant, go and sit down and let me serve you? Or he's going to say to his servant, you go and prepare my meal, bring to me, and wait until I finish. And when I am finished, then you can go and eat your meal. That's what he said. He said, will the master say to him, let me serve you your meal? He said, I throw not. Right? Then he said now, when the master finished now, then the servant can go and have his meal. Right? And then Jesus said, therefore he will say, I am an unprofitable servant and I did what I was commanded. Are you following that? Now when you fit it in today's what? Modern way of thinking. You'd have cursed the master and you'd have cursed everybody. Because you're going to say, oh, you come out of the field working so hard. 
And when you come in, you have to give him his food. He could have put his food on the table himself and so on. And sometimes when you're working for people, you forgot who you're working for. Well, you're silent about that one. That's a fact. Sometimes we're working for people, we forget who we're working for. We think that we have the blade and they have the, uh, they have the handle and we have the blade. That's what we think. Are you following that? But you've got to understand the principle in the Bible is that we must have the heart of a servant. We must have the what? The heart to want to serve. You must have the heart to want to help. That's the heart we're supposed to have. So Jesus came and he demonstrated that to us. And you can imagine the word of God that took on flesh. Lord of the entire earth, creator of the universe, bow before men and wash their feet. And while our pride is so stunned sometimes, that we can't even humble ourselves to just do simply what God has to do. And if the Lord of heaven and earth bow himself before men and wash their feet. And we think it is so hard to do certain things. Can you imagine? So God doesn't take that one lightly because he said, I am Christ, your Lord and master, right? And what you see me do, he's, he's telling them they should do it too, right? Because he said, I am Christ. The servant is not greater than his what? Lord. Get it? But he humbled himself to set an example among us. That he said if he did it to us, to us, then we must do it also to one another. Understand what he's telling you here. He did not make himself of any reputation. He didn't big up the idea that I am God, so I don't really need to do this or I don't really need to do that. He shows you the heart of God. He shows you the kindness of God. And he expects us to emulate that kind of kindness. And he expects us to humble ourselves and do like what he did. That's what he expects of us. Now, when you run the, the, the board or we behave many times, you will see the fact of the matter is that we behave contrary. Now, granted, you know, as some of us would say, we are not perfect, right? Good. Well, I say I am perfect in terms of what the Bible means by being perfect. It means to be mature. You understand that? So when you guys discuss perfection, when you, when you are wrong, you said, I am not perfect. You must get rid of that nonsense. Everybody know you are not as we would say, uh, 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 perfection like God, as you would like to put it. When God said Job was perfect in his generation, he's not talking the word, English word, like you talk. He's talking about the man was mature, the man was righteous, the man was holy. You understand the idea? Noah was what? Perfect in his generation too, and he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Again, Noah was righteous. You get it? Noah was holy. You understand that? So when God sees that, God calls him what? Perfect. He reaches a stage of maturity where he learns how to walk with God and what? Submit himself to God. That's the idea right there. So Jesus came and he showed us that. So power is not only to heal and deliver people. Power is learning how to keep yourself and walk in God too. Because you have many preachers who pray for people to be healed and they themselves are what? Cast away. Locked out of the kingdom because the same power they lay hands on people for Jesus to heal they didn't have the power to even believe God that he can keep them without doing all that kind of stuff see so power is just what a whole lot of stuff but when Jesus came he showed us how to live so you can't say you don't have no example to see how to live he came on earth and showed us how to live praise the Lord somebody right good so God asked the question, who, who are you going to like me to? See, that's what he's asking. Who are you going to like me to? Now, so when you go back down in Philippians, what he said after that? Verse 8, what he said? So you got to understand then, you see that? Man must what? Humble himself before God. He came. And that's why you see the Bible tells you several things about Christ. So sometimes people, they, they would preach and said, well, if Christ had sinned, we would not have been saved and so on and so forth and all of that and so on. There's no if about Christ. He couldn't sin. Are you following that? Good. Now, you got to understand who we are. Now, number one, we, we learn about chromosomes in school, right? And, and we have about, what, 48 of them in us, right? Am I right, Sister D? Or is 46? Which one is it? 23, 23, right? 46 chromosomes, right? Good. Now, when Jesus was conceived, he was not born of the seed of a man. 
So he didn't have the 46, he had 23. He had the blood of a woman. Are you following that? Hello? Good. His nature was not a human nature. He had a human form. Get it? But there was no contribution from a man to form him. You get it? So he couldn't sin, really. So what you got to understand is that God is, not, God is not looking, as it were, for sinless perfection, as we put the word perfection, out of you. God is looking for a heart of humility. He's looking for a heart of a servant and a heart that he can really work through and get what he desire a human being to become who serve him. That's what he really wants. Praise the Lord. So when you hear people say, I have to stop doing this first and I have to stop doing that, you can't do one single thing to help yourself, really. If, even if you reform, there are things inside here that only God alone can change. You could stop doing it and everybody see you stop, but what is going on inside here? Oh man, you got to understand, some people, they don't do certain things, in the, but boy, they're right inside here. Are you following that? So it's only God and the example that he set for us that can actually change us. So I go back to Peter again. And everybody remember St. John chapter 21, 20, when he said, Simon Peter, lovest thou me more than these? Remember what he said? What did he answer and say? And then he said what? Simon Peter, lovest thou me more than these? What else he said? Well, well look, why not? That's a fine. There's, there's a point I want to make right here. Basically connotating the same thing, but let's see, where is it again? It's in chapter twenty one, is it? Chapter twenty one. Verse fifteen. Someone there. Eighty. Let's find it. You find you found it? Verse 15 to about 18. Have you found it? John, the last chapter. 21. I'm doing that because of God's character. There's some point I'm making right here. Verse 15. What, let's read it what it says. Okay, so let us pause there. What is the lovest? What is these? Lovest thou me more than these? What is the these? Good. Just like Sister B said, what did God say to, to him and Andrew, to James and John? What did God say to them? He said, I, he said from now on you shall be what? Fishers of men. You remember that? He also told them that he was going to die, he's going to come back from the dead, and he's going to meet them on the way when they were walking to wherever. You remember that? He said that to them. Good. But when he died, and he rose from the dead, and that time they already saw him about twice. But they went back to fishing. And because they follow Peter, basically, okay? Because remember, originally, Peter... And his brother Andrew, they were fishermen when Jesus first called them because they were like disciples of John the Baptist. Then after that, he passed the boat of Zebedee and he saw John and um, James, rather, and John, his brother. John was the youngest one. And he called them. You remember that? And then when he talked to all of them, he said, you will be now fishers of men. Right? Or in other words, then he called them to be evangelists and then later, if you wish, apostles. Okay? Good. Now, when he died, what did they go back to do? They went back to the past. Are you following that? Do you know there are some of us who are Christians right here now? And some of us, in terms of our attitude, it was better when we were sinners. And when we become Christians, we turn pigs or something? For some reason, I don't know why. Hello? Are, are you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, it's the truth. So, they went back. So, if we say, back into Egypt. You get it? So God said to the Israelites, 
you will not be like the people that you leave in Egypt doing the things that they do and you will not be like the one of them who you are going towards in Canaan to do like what they do either do what I say you should do okay so they went back are you following that to what they used to do before the fact of the matter is that sometimes when we fail God instead of going and repent and instead of having the heart of what a servant and so on guess what we do we go straight back to what we used to do and try whole remnants of certain things and think it's going to please God never will please God so Jesus asked him the question then lovest thou me more than these and what he said to him he said yea Lord I what I love thee so what Jesus said to him feed my what my little ones right so that's what he was supposed to have been doing. Then he gone back to what? To what he used to do. Are you following that? Read the next part again. When you hear God ask anything more than once, the serious business he's talking here. Read what he said again. You notice the knees. One moment. You notice the knees not there. Lovest thou me more than these? Now he's asking him now. The first one was for the deeds. The next one is for what? Him personally. Read what he asked again. Good. Those are the what? All the ones. Good. Read on now. Read the next thing now. I most solemnly tell you, okay? Yep, double verse. Target what, what he's going to tell him, right? And he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you what he said. Get it? He's telling them how death is gonna die. And he's telling them all of them. Can you imagine somebody look at you and tell you oh you're gonna die and then tell you follow me? See that? That's power. He's gonna give him the power to do it he already knows how he's going to die but at the same time he's saying to him follow me and notice how he timely asked him three times okay and now he's telling him really really i say unto you all of this and uh, when you used to lead yourself carry yourself where you want to go time is going to come and they still live unbound you know, but he said follow me see that good well you got to understand then when it's shows you how he lived. Jesus came as a servant. You remember that, right? He was found passion as a man. He knew the mission that was supposed to go down, right? And he prayed, Lord, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, let thy will be done. All of this. And he submitted himself unto death. Are you following that? Good. So you remember when you read Isaiah 53 last week, those of you who were here, he saw the arm of the Lord who grew up among men, right? Dry ground, all of that. And then he was wounded for a transgression due to our iniquity to cast five means of our pieces upon him. And with his stripes we are healed and all of that, right? And then he was allotted a portion with what? The wicked and so on. But the important thing is that, the important thing is that, here he shows us what kind of heart he's supposed to have. Hello? Good. So that's why he went back, talked to Peter, because you got to understand what's going on here. Are you seeing that? Good. So you got to see when, when God calls you, you got to see even what, even what you don't have, you got to pray to get it. 
because that's the only way you're going to serve God and please God. Hallelujah. Now, read down what he said here. As a result of all that he did, I notice, God always has a reward. And that's why in the book of Hebrews, it tells you that you are not serving God for naught. Because God will what? Will reward you. You following that? Good. So when you're serving him, you must understand he's going to reward you. Good. Now, you got to understand how God is going to deal with the reward, right? And we're not going to discuss that tonight, but you got to understand that he has records. And a lot of us, we don't realize that when the Bible tells you how God has books or scrolls, if you may, and he records things in it. Are you following that? I will remind you again. He's omnipresent. But at the same time, when you go back to Genesis and you see when he came down to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, God talked to himself and wondered in his own heart if I should tell Abraham what I was going to do. And he said that, I know he's going to order his house after me and that to teach him judgment and justice, okay? But he said, after that he decided, coming up, that I'm going to come, I'm going to tell him then. And God said to Abraham, talking to Abraham, he said, I've heard all the things that is happening in Sodom and Gomorrah. I come down to see with my two eyes myself. That's what God said, right? And Abraham started now praying if the God, if the, if the judge of the earth is going to what? Judge the wicked with the righteous. And he started praying until he get down to what? Five. You remember that one? Good. Now, understand God. See that? Again, it is showing you his humility. See that? He could just say, well, I know this and I know that and I don't need to ask Abraham. Nothing tell Abraham anything but watch God. That's not God. God deals with relationship and he deals with developing relationships. That's what he did. So God will know. Elijah, what are you doing here? God already knew all of that. But God deals with what? Relationship. Talk to me and I talk to you. That's what God did. God will say, this is what you really want to do. He already know what you have in your heart, but he just only asks you. And sometimes when he finished talking to you now, you realize that you have the wrong idea in the heart. Sometimes he doesn't just say, look, you have the wrong idea. He asks you things. This is what you really want to do. It is showing you that God, being a part at the same time, but at the same time, his humility surpasses anything that you can think of. And when you consider that, my little humility can't even match up to his own. You get it? Good. But if he's the creator of all things, then he can bow himself down in front of people and watch their feet. Well, it's best I try my best to be number two. You're asking something, brother? word when you see perfection in the Bible it is translated from Greek Hebrew word to mean change. That's what it really means. In the modern day of how you discuss perfection is in the English concept of it. It is not the biblical way when people when a man say I am not perfect that is the English way he's talking concept. When he sees perfect in the Bible when you see conversation in King James Version how many of you talk and come to the mind? How many of you? 
Good. But when you see conversation in King James Version, if you go back to 1611, conversation means your manner of life, your conduct, your behavior. Today it means, there you go. When you see perfection in 1611 and before that, in the Bible, it means maturity in 1611. Okay? Now we in our time, most people read it and interpret it in the modern time. But that's what the word meant, dead. Do you understand that? Hello? Right, that's what it meant then. So when, when God, when the Bible said, be ye perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. If that's what the word meant, you can be perfect like God. If that's what the word meant. In 1611 is be ye mature as your heavenly father is mature. Because he said he's kind to everybody. You get it? He sent the rain upon the what? The just and the unjust. What else he said? He's kind to all, right? Good. He sends sunshine on everybody. And so he tells us then we must be mature as he is. Right? Good. So you got to understand God puts place imprints in the Bible that we can see. Now when I tell you I am mature, I am spiritually mature. That's the idea right there. We're not talking about from the human perspective. We're talking spiritually mature. Good. It can be proved measly inside here. If somebody says anything bad about you, watch how you start already. And it will tell me you're not mature. It's as simple as that. They just need to say something bad about you and you're upset. And some of you go home and you're not going to sleep tonight either. Okay? So you got to understand what we're talking about here. So understand then what he came to show us and to accomplish in us is to bring us like he is. Now he said, if they speak evil of your Lord and Master, they will speak evil of you too. Get it? If they speak good of him... He will speak good of you too. So understand then, you are not above what? If he wasn't above them speaking evil of him, you're not above it either. But when you're mature in the Lord, you already know people going to say stuff. You already know they might even say, but he, what did he say in, in, in the Bible? He said, blessed are he, Matthew chapter 5, when men shall what? Revile you, they shall what? Persecute you. They shall say all manner of evil against you. False. If it is false, I'm talking. Falsely for my sake. What he said he must do. That's the hardest thing for us to do. He said rejoice and be what? Exceed. And that is not just be glad. That is to be glad in abundance. Exceedingly glad. For when you hear it happen and you're innocent, great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted the prophets which were before you. Right. But we can't do that. Yes. We want blood. We want vengeance. We want to defend ourselves. And if possible, extract vengeance and justice. <laughs> but Jesus said, rejoice. That's why I tell you, when people say things about me, I learn it. I will just, when they used to say, you're acting like you're a God, because of my faith, sometimes when I express it, they'll tell me, I look, I'm acting like, you're acting like you're a God. I used to get offended. No, I said, thank you, Jesus, I look like I'm getting there. That's what I say now. <laughs> you get it? At least Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. It's just about time I look like him now, time I imitate him now. So when they see me, they must see God. And I said, Lord, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. We know what they mean, but whatever they say, that's what they see. Because sometimes you said, I know God will work it out, but you're going on like you're God. X, Y, Z, so, so, so. You get it? Good. And sometimes people just hate you just because of God. And that's why they hate Jesus. Just because of you call God Abba. His personal father, they would say, Abai, you, our father. He said, Abba. See that? And they hated him just because of what? Every time they see him, it reminds them of their sins. So they hated him the more. See? So understand then what Paul tells you here, Philippians. Go back there. Now, notice then God has rewards for your behavior, right? God is asking the question, who are you going to like me to? Can, any, can anybody that you know be like Jesus to you? 
There's nobody. No matter how you love them, they can't be like Jesus to you. See? So listen to what he said right here. And while I'm telling you this, I want you to run your mind personally here. Okay? Judas, Jesus had how many disciples? Twelve of them. And the twelve supposed to be what? Of all the disciples that he had, the twelve supposed to be what to him? Close to him. Right? They live with him. They see how he prays. They see when he gets up in the morning what he does. He goes up into the mountain early and pray. When he comes back down, he says, take me to the city to preach. All of this kind of stuff. That's all of it, right? Good. But he had three of them personally that he revealed things to that he didn't reveal to the rest. Are you following that? That's Peter, James, and John. So when Jesus left them down in the mountain, if you read the Bible carefully, Mount Transfiguration, he went up on the mountain. And the next day, he came down. And it's only three of them saw certain things. And when he was ready again to reveal certain things, only three of them he revealed it. He said, don't tell nobody until I'm resurrected from the dead. Are you following that? Good. But he had Judas there with him too. And some of you, Judas, sit down right in your midst and you can't take it. You want to kill everybody? Hello, he had Judas sitting right there. Everybody know Judas was a crook. Everybody know Judas was stealing. But he went around, did his miracles and all that Jesus sent him out to do. But you got to understand, Paul tells you that some people sin follow them and some people sin go ahead of them. In other words, they are catching up to their sin and the others, everywhere they go, it is just following them. Sooner or later, people find out who you really are. Are you following that? Good, so remember that. He was a crook. And the Bible said he, he had the money bag. You know, he was a treasurer. And he was stealing money from the bag. When a woman with oil, you remember? He was the one who said, this oil could have been sold for how much money and, and he give the poor and so on. While he's giving the poor, he's taking out his share too. And you think Jesus didn't know all of that? Yeah. It's Judah. Praise the Lord. It's just a Greek form of Judah. That's his name. Judas from he's from Iscariot. Well, okay. If this was written in the Greek way, like it for Matthew, Matthew was first written in Hebrew. So Matthew would have been is the Greek form of the name. So they do it invariably. They write, the English people prefer to use Judah because he betrayed Jesus. And then nobody else didn't write in the book. But if you read the Bible sometimes, you will see they will say Judas, not his character. Like in John 12, I believe. Right? So it's just the Greek form of the name, but it's really Judah. Okay? But I, while I'm going to read that, I want you to remember Jesus knew he was a crook. And he was going around doing miracles just like all of them. Carry oil with him and anoint people and heal them. But he wasn't learning. Got the idea? He was learning. See? He was just looking for opportunity all the time to capitalize on things. When are you going to betray me? He knows his name is the dialogue. See? All everybody asked him, when he finally said he go, is it I, Lord? So Jesus knew all of that, right? So let's go to verse 9, what it said. Wherefore God had also what? Highly exalted him and given him a name. And that's what we were looking at last time. A name that is what? Above everyone. Name. Good? So we said, therefore, then God gave him his what? His own name. Right? Hello? Good, so read on right there. So in the name of Jesus, every knee will what? Bow. Of the things where? So if it is not now, it is later. Because God gave him his own name. His name, Jesus the Savior, right? And we see the word actually is Savior in Hebrew is like Yeshua. That's Y-A-S-H-U-A. 
right? They call Jesus Yeshua. Just like Isaiah, Isaiah simply means Yahweh is salvation, right? Jesus' name means the same thing, Yahweh is salvation, Yahweh the Savior. Same thing it means when you baptize the name of Jesus, you are baptized in the name of Yahweh the Savior. You get the idea? Good. The angel said you shall call his name what? Jesus. So it roots straight to salvation again. And God is the God of what? Salvation. Are you following that? So he gave him his own name. So we looked in um, what Jeremiah chapter 23 and we see that and you can find it. It's print big in your Bible. The Lord our righteousness. Jeremiah chapter 23. So you'll see that God gave him his own name. And the name is above every name. Yahweh's name is above every name. Good. So when you look in Jeremiah, you can find it. So somebody had asked a question last time. We were looking at... Um, when, when God said, we looked in St. John chapter 10 when they were asking Jesus a question. You can turn back there again. Some of you weren't here, so I'm just recapping that right there. Go back to chapter 10 and verse 24 when they asked Jesus several questions. He declared himself who he is. Hello? Pardon me? No, no, I was telling you, if you look in Jeremiah chapter 23, you will see print big. I think it's four or six. It's there where he said he, his name shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Did you see that one? It, well, turn there, please. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 23. I think it's verse 6. It's printed big in your Bible. It's kept alive. Which would have been Yahweh sit to know. In English, it is the Lord our righteousness or Jehovah our righteousness. You can read the whole, the whole verse right there. His name will be called a branch, all of that kind of thing. Everybody read verse 6 there. Right. So in other words, he carried the same name as the Father. You get the idea? Hello, everybody. Good. Now, Hallelujah. The compound one, Yahweh is salvation, Yahweh is sin. Okay? And they call him Yeshua. And that, when it ends with the H, salvation. If you meet a Jew, an Orthodox Jew right now, they don't even want you to say that word anymore. Because it reminds them of Jesus. And they were taught several bad things about Jesus. Okay. Now, Let's go to the book of... Now, I, I told you somebody was asking a question, right? St. John chapter 10. Then somebody asked a question. And then we look at Deuteronomy chapter 32 and catch it from there. St. John chapter 10, verse 24, when they asked Jesus a question, if thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. And you're going to see, they never asked him if he was the son of God and they never asked him if he was the son of man. But the moment he answered, all of those came right into being right there when he answered, right? Good, so you go back to verse 24 and they, they ask him the question coming down. They ask him if he's a Christ, tell us plainly, right? Hello, verse 24. Hey, wake up, wake up, wake up. They ask him if you are the Christ, tell us what? Plainly. In other words, stop talking in mysteries. Okay? And he said what? Read quickly what he said. So that's the first thing they were supposed to look at. Look at the work that he was doing. And then check out his life if it matched. That's what they were supposed to have been doing. Are you seeing that? Notice he said, bears witness of me. In other words, it had the signature of God on it. Because the blind man said, nobody you ever heard since the world began ever opened the eyes of the blind. You have not known any historical record that ever said that. Not even Moses himself opened the eyes of a blind. See, so the man is saying, if this man wasn't be of God, wasn't of God, he could not have done all that he did. So a blind man who they call a sinner could recognize God in the flesh and they couldn't recognize him because of their pride. 
Are you seeing that? Read on. Verse 26. But he believed not because... So only the sheep can what? Hear him. And only the sheep can what? Follow him. There's some here and they don't follow. And you have those who hear and follow. You remember he said, when the day when he come, right? And he said that, some going to say to him, did we not what? Do miracles in your name and cast out demons in your name. All of this. And he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. See? Now granted, you know, those people that they did it too probably end up being saved, but they themselves cast away. So you got to understand what he said. My sheep hear my voice. They know me and they follow me. They don't follow nobody else. Read on. Now this is where they had a problem now. See that? So God has reward. Wherefore God has also highly exalted him, given him a name above every name, right? That at the name of Jesus of me shall bow all of this kind of stuff. Notice what then God. God as it were, as we would say, deliver the entire creation for him to rule over. That's why it says he's an heir of God, being the inheritor. That, but he's talking from the physical standpoint of him becoming a human being. Now an angel can't sit on the throne to rule, so God had to what? His word had to become a man. Because down here God gave man dominion, and up there God has what? Dominion. You get it? So God not going to break his order. So that's why Jesus had to become a man, so that he'll have dominion here. So that's why when Jesus wants to talk to you, he can come personally as a man and talk to you. You get it? Because if he became a man, then he has dominion now down here. And that's why I said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. See that? Good. Because he has dominion here now. That's why he could forgive sin when he came in the earth. As a man speaking to them, your sins be forgiven. See that? They would have to go to the high priest to tell them that one. Now, so he said to them now what he said here. So you got to understand, eternal life is supposed to be important to you. It's supposed to be important to me. You got it? You can't run the risk and die in your sin. You're going to hell if you do. Are you going to the lake of fire? You could behave rudely right now. And do what you want or do it in your heart, however you want to do it. But God knows everything that is in there. You die right now and you're going to hell just the same. And if you read Ezekiel chapter 18, 33, it says, If the righteous man turn away from the way of righteousness and begin to do that which is evil, his righteousness shall never be accounted unto him. And if he dies the way he dies, then he'll be gone. If the evil man... Turn from his wickedness and begin to do those things that are righteous, then his evil ways will not be accounted unto him because God is going to judge him as he's living now. So eternal life is a serious thing. But as either some of us, I don't know if we want it, it seems like we think it's some trophy, we, we, we must run the price to get it or something, or however, thinking that the man granted. No. God judged the heart, God judged the motive, God judged the action. Hello? So you could feel what you do and you feel justified and you went home and feel fool. I could die that way. You'll never inherit eternal life. Now you gotta you and I have to weigh the pros and cons, because that's what Jesus came to give us. Remember last week we said we go to first John. You remember that? He said, That which we what? See, that which we touch. You get it? From the yeah. He said, the eternal life that is from God. Well, I, every time I talk, I, I just tell you read it. Because when you read it, you see, it, it will probably just judge your memory, right? First John, then we go back to, don't lose St. John chapter 10. First John, right? You got to see eternal life as something important. And, it, and you must treat it as important. That's why you cannot live frivolously, talk frivolously, and do frivolous things. First John 1, right? I'll read a little portion there. Now notice the emphasis he's going to be making right there. What he said. Everybody, find it, read it. That which was from the what? The beginning. Pause right there. Get it? He's going way back when. 
that which that which are he who was from the beginning his word so you can say that if he was right read on which he have what heard I remember them people in the Old Testament they heard but they didn't see a thing they feel spirit and all of that but they didn't see the thing go on now you get it now which we have seen which we have what which we have what? Get it, you get it? Go on. No, that's the part I like. Get it? And what he said? Of the word of life. See, in the Bible there, it would be like the Tao life. Right? Good. That's all embracing. Okay? Including just about everything you think about resurrection, life that is beyond the mind, that the mind can't even conceive. Go on. So Jesus is the thou, you get it? The eternal life that was with God all along. You understand that men never see. Now they're looking at eternal life. They're touching it. And feel it. And see it. In other words now, it's a surety that indeed we are going to be immortals as he is. The eternal life that was with God that nobody ever seen. God now revealed. And they said we see it and we touch it. See? Now you think he died to give us something like that. And you think that, or I think that we can take it lightly when we talk about eternal life and the consequences of thinking of eternal life, you'll have to think of the price he paid for us to get us that life that was with him to give it to us too. And you and I think that if we violate his word all the time, and you really think that he's going to just give it to you just like that, Think again. Hallelujah. So when they ask him if he's the Christ, eternal life comes up that Christ gives eternal life. And he said, only sheep who hears him and follow him will receive the truth. Go back to chapter 10 now. Oh, glory. Now he said, go back to 23 now. 20, 28 rather. What he said. They follow me. No, re read that part. They follow me. Come on, everybody. Three the first. They follow me. I want you to read it like there's no full stop. They follow me and. Okay, go, let's go back. The previous verse, they follow me and I. Read on. So right there now he claims equality with God. Are you seeing that? Right there with God the Father. You get that? No man is able to pluck them out of my hand. No man, and he elevated a statement now to demonstrate where the power comes from. No man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. The same hand, I and my father are one. The Jews understood him very clearly because they know where that scripture came from. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 39. Find it. Thank you, Jesus. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 39, 40. Everybody, you found it? Oh, hallelujah. So eternal life, notice then, God gave him everything to rule over. Psalm 2 demonstrated that for us. He'll give him the heathen to rule over. So wherefore God highly exalted him and give him a name above what? Every name. You get the idea? His own name is above every name. Good.
So in other words then, he obeying God received the reward, right? Good, as eternal ruler, and you got to understand, he is the one now who give eternal life to all those who want to hear him and follow him. That is the what? The reward. So you are serving God, and you understand that you're going to have a spiritual body, and in that body dwells what? Eternal life, like though they touched Jesus, saw him, all of that stuff. Get it? You must understand and weigh the pros and the cons when you are going to consider things, doing things, whatever. You must understand what you're serving God for. If all the other stuff them that bother you so much and you think those things are important, then maybe they are important to you, but you'll die and lose your soul. Eternal life is something that you have to give yourself for and desire it more than anything else. That's what it is. So if you're a Christian and you didn't sit down and count the cost, you probably need to pack up shop and leave it. Because as long as you're in this body, things are going to happen. But you have to make up your mind that they can all happen and you are going to serve Christ straight to the end just to say. If you can allow people to turn you back and allow people to make you behave out of sorts, then you're not worthy of Christianity. If you can put your hand to the plow while you're looking back, at the same time while you want to go forward, you're not worthy of Christianity. That's what Jesus said. You got to make up your own mind if you really want to be a Christian. Because that's the prize he offer you. And if that prize is precious and eternal to you, in terms of you being what? Change in this vile body here, never to have this body anymore. If you don't have a dream to get that body, Christianity is not for you. Telling you from now. You can make it yours if you really want to. Hallelujah. Deuteronomy 32, you got it? 3940, read what it says. That's a whole lot of emphasis there, IME. Third person singular is using it right there, okay? Good. That means there is none like him. Go on. There is no God with me, right? What else he said? Good. That, that, in the Greek, it said pluck right there, right? In the Hebrew, that's what it said, right? It means the same thing. Nobody can what? Deliver out of his hand. Nobody can seize anything out of his hand. Nobody can pluck anything out of his hand. You get it? So the Jews understood him clearly what he was saying. Read the next verse. He was talking to Moses at the time. You get it? So in other words, he said, I am, I am. I live forever. Always. You get the idea? Good. He said, so when you read that verse now, you remember what Jesus said. What did Jesus say when, uh, when he went to Lazarus' um, death? What did he say? There you go. That's it right there. I am the resurrection and the life. I kill and I make alive. And the word wound doesn't mean like the slice. The word wound means a whole lot of stuff. It, can, it means to crush. It means to burn you. Huh? It means to crush you through. All of that stuff it means. Get it? So in other words, God has the power to destroy anything he wants. Anything he wants. Nobody can stop him. If you are in the hand of God, then he tells you, nobody can deliver you out of what? My hand. He's talking to sheep. So you have to consider this. Who is your greatest enemy now? Is it your neighbor? Is it the sister over there or the brother over there? Who is your greatest one? Yourself. You are the only one who can deliver yourself out of his hand. So you walk and talk about this person this and this person that and this one to be this and this one to be that. And that's why I can't bother uh, with this Christian thing no more. You're talking real rubbish. You just wanted to go back in the world a long time. You're just only looking for an excuse to get there. Fact of the matter is that nobody can deliver you out of his hand. If you love him, nobody can tear you out of his hand. They could try all they want, they can get you out of his hand. See? Oh, hallelujah. Get it? So when you tell me about the devil this and the devil that, well, maybe you and the devil just love what you do. But the devil can't deliver you. What? Take you out of his hand either. See, nobody, he said, can take them out. He said, I give them eternal life, and nobody can pluck it out of my hand. Nobody can pluck it. So you are your greatest enemy. 
You're the one who have to decide whether you're going to walk with him. You're the one who have to decide if you're going to listen to the public opinion or you're going to listen to what he said. You're the one who have to decide, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. You are the one who have to decide that. It's not going to just happen like that. You've got to decide that right here. So if nobody can pluck you out of his hand, why some of you are so perturbed all the time? Why some of you think somebody's a threat to your Christianity? Why you make people a threat to your sanity? Why you make people upset you till when you go home you can't even sleep? Why? They named Jesus? The Bible said he give us what? There's a proverb, I think he said he give us what? Sweet, sweet. He's a good love and sweet. See? And when he give you anything, he does not any sorrow to it. But the Lord bless you with something, and by the time they all start criticizing you, you go home with sorrow with the blessing that the Lord gave you. Instead of you rejoice. And said, God, maybe you work out something for them one day too. And you gone home to cry and how good you are and why them have to think about this of me. Look how I've been kind to them. Look how I've been this. Look how I've been that. Well, what do you expect Jesus to say? What he has been doing for them and me and you? What would he have to say? He must be up there bawling and say, look how kind I've been to them. And this is what they deliver to me. Think again. So if you don't devalue eternal life, my friend, Christianity is not true. But so that's what God offers you at the end of this world. Okay? A life of immortality. One life itself. See that? If you don't value it, well, you're going to keep doing what you're doing. You're not going to stop. Now, so if you are your greatest enemy, then you have to start looking at your own attitude. You have to start looking on the vision. You have to start asking yourself, why do I behave like this when I get angry? Why do I hate people? All of them, you got to start asking yourself, not because the power is in you to get rid of all of that. But can you just lie down like some Christian think God is going to do everything for them? That's why he tells you, when he said, no weapon form against you shall prosper, right? And then he said, every tongue that rise up against you in judgment. Who said must condemn it? Some people pray and say, but Lord, you said, as if to say, God said, he will condemn it. God said, you must condemn it. See? So there are things that God gives you to do. When he said, put on the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness, you can come to church and you'll feel bad and all of that. Anybody ask you something, well, I don't feel so good today. I don't feel so good today. I don't feel so good today. Sure, you're going to continue feeling bad. So you're not saying what God says. You're saying your own thing. This is like God said, let the weak say, I am strong. You think the man didn't know he's weak? But he said, let him say, I am what? Strong. It has nothing to do with how he feels in terms of why he shouldn't say. He knows he's there, it is there. He knows he feels weak. But God said, let the weak say, I am strong. The Lord is my what? Strength and my song. You get it? Good. So feel weak, but say what God said. That's all God asks. That's all he wants. See? And that's why you got to understand, it's not your faith. The word brings faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So it has nothing to do with your condition. It has to do with the word that you believe and you're speaking it. You understand? So even though you feel like you're dying and you just said, you know, you say what God said. You keep saying what God said and say what God said. It has nothing to do with if you even drop down and die. fact of the matter is that you're going down believing what God said. Remember Jesus, Father forgive them for they know not what they do. And he was going down what? There you go. Lord let this come pass from me. Nevertheless let thy will be done. But he was doing what? He was going to die. See? But he believed what? Straight down to death. What does the Bible say? Psalm 16. The Lord loveth the death of his son. So even in death you have the hope of resurrection because of eternal life. Praise now let's read down what they said now. Verse 33, they said what? Verse 31 rather. Then the Jews took up stone. Again to what? Stone him. 
Because they understood what he said, right? It's from Deuteronomy chapter 32. Then what, what happened here? And Jesus answered them, many good works. Have I show you from my father for which of these works he what? Stoned me. Good. Now, hear how foolish they were like some of them. Read what they said. So what was contradictory with their statement right there? Say what they said again. They said, for a good work, we stone thee not. So they acknowledge that he was doing good work. But if they were thinking of him raising the dead, and they were thinking that he opened the eyes of the blind, and they were thinking that he did what? Miracles like change water to what? Wine. You get it? Cleanse lepers. Woman with the history of blood healed. Right? If they were thinking of the many things he did, speaking to the wind and said, stop blowing. See, keep quiet. If they were thinking, they said, many good work we see of you. But they said, you're a blasphemer. So their statement is contradictory because the work was a signature of God working in him. Are you following that? And he wasn't like any other prophet. There is no prophet here in the Bible that just went down anywhere and see a dead person and say, get up. He did it several times. And he never had to lie down like Elisha and Elijah and blow in their nostril and all of that kind of stuff. Lazarus, come forth! Or we just go by the tomb when they're going to Nahin and the woman with her one son who died and he just held him and said, all right. They never seen nothing like that before. See, all of you stand up and say, oh, wonderful Jesus is to me. You can't even raise yourself like me. And even call it. See, Jesus will raise them from the dead. Right? He showed kindness to a whole lot of folks in Israel. And all of that. Always challenged by the Pharisees. When he saw the woman who bowed over like this. And all of that. He saw the man with the widowed hand. And all of that had compassion. He said, over 5,000 one time excluding women and children. Then he said, another 4,000 excluding women and children. See that? Multitudes. And guess what? They weren't thinking about all of that. They must have heard him they were there. See? But what if they were thinking about all of that? Could they come to the conclusion that he was a blasphemer? There you go. See? So you got to understand then, sometimes when you're serving God, and certain things start happening to you. When you're not thinking the way you're supposed to be thinking, that's what you conclude. Christianity is not for me. Don't know if I can live this life. I can't take when people trouble me. Can't take when them bother me because I will do things that I'm not supposed to do. Now, by the time you say all them words, you know, Satan already putting them in motion for you. He has just put them in motion. He just drop a little word in your heart. Yeah, hate them, man. He said, all them wicked people. And Satan said, yeah, them vile people. See? And then before long, you build up a whole business going. Body starts shaking. And when you see them, boy, it's only probably the Lord would lock you up, but why you never do what you wanted to do? See, but you got to understand, is eternal life important to you? Is it really? So John give you a clear description of what, of what it looks like, that you can touch it, feel it, hear it, talk. So you got to what? Decide if that's what you want. So they call him a blasphemer. See that? That's a contradictory contradiction. Sir. But they came to the conclusion in verse 31, that you're a man and you make yourself God. See? The question is, again, notice what they, they say. They're basically saying he's establishing equality in God. This time they say, you make yourself God. See that? Good. Well, go back to chapter 8. We read a clip there and then we... You notice it said, the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Again. Hello, are you there? That's in verse 31, right? They took up stones again to stone him because of what he said in chapter 8. Now, Jesus speak eternal words, right? So I want you to go to verse 31 and I want you to see what he said. 
chapter um, 8. Are you in verse 31? What it says? Underline the word continue. Continue does not mean you come to church and you read your Bible one and two times and you're kind to a few people. Okay? Because Paul says it in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and he said, Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and though I give my body to be burned and have not loved, stop set me nothing. Okay? So it's not coming to church like you just come and so on. It's the heart that you come with. The mind that you come with. The spirit you come with. See? The diligence you come with. The dedication you come with. The yearn you come with. The hunger you come with. That's what it is. If you continue in my word, what he said, then are he what? My disciples indeed. So technically speaking, some of us are not his disciples. And when you go home, you can always cuss me for it. Okay? But the truth of the matter is that he said if you continue in my word, so if you're not walking according to the word, you can't be no disciple. But he said if you continue in my, in my word, see that? Then are ye my disciples indeed. In other words, gladly you are my disciples. Yes, sir. You being mature doesn't mean you're not gonna get angry. You being mature doesn't mean you're gonna get you're not gonna get angry. And it doesn't mean you're not gonna walk away.
No, but I'm saying it doesn't necessarily mean that. There are some things that you have to deal with. Remember when Jesus went in the temple and he saw them doing what they were doing inside him? He got angry. He started throwing them out. I have to walk away, that's what I'm saying. I don't have to walk away. I could get upset, but I can control myself. That's what the Bible uses the word temper. The ability to exercise control. So I am angry, be ye angry and sin not. Remember that? The Bible never tells you you can't get angry. He said, when you get angry, for you not to sin, it means you bring yourself in control. Right. Yeah. what he said. that some folk um, and if you said okay we have different levels of maturity that is true fact of the matter is that some people have no level of maturity. okay the, the simple litmus test is you'll see some people they explode almost one time when something happens if they don't they wait till they go home and then maybe whatever they have to matter get matter okay all we're saying is that is this Jesus said, if you continue in my word, the moment he said continue in my word, it simply means to practice it. Because the moment you practice the word of God, you'll get better at it. And, and by, like, God said it. chapter 8, the man who do these things, and so for him to live by them, he has to continue to practice that. 
Now there's no person that can stop lying except he makes up his mind that he's going to stop. That doesn't mean he won't slip today or slip tomorrow. But if he continues to try not to lie, sooner or later he'll achieve his goal. But when he doesn't see anything with his lying and he thinks that is okay if it is necessary, he's never going to stop. See, a lot of Christians want God to just come and do things for them, but they don't think that they have to meet God halfway through. So we're talking about continue in. So you got to understand, some people in churches, fact of the matter is that some of them are not Christians. By the very fact how they live and by the very fact how they call. And there are certain simple basic things, even as a Christian, if, you, if, if one is following the Lord, you can't tell me nobody's a Christian and bad world is a part of their vocabulary. Dead serious. Maybe you have to go and meet Jesus again at the cross. But at the same time, if it's a part of your makeup, because I know a lady who told me, you know, how much she prays in the morning, she told me to step up an altar in her house and all of that and what have you, what have you. And one day, there's a teacher, okay? And one day, and she always, you know, talk about Jesus, all of that. And I don't know what somebody said, whatever. But I was in her classroom. I think I was going to invigilate her. Right? And by the time that she had the person down talking, nobody heard what they were saying. And, I, and I, all I were, all, only heard is the bad word came out of her mouth. I was so shocked, I couldn't even believe it. Sure. There you go. He'll never stop. He's a liar, man. I didn't say he must write her. Listen to what I said. Listen to what I said. Okay. 